Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, and I'm the host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. Before we get started with our fascinating conversation this afternoon, <clears throat> I always like to just give people a little bit of information about Alzheimer's Speaks because we're always getting new listeners, which is so fun. Um, so briefly, um, who we are and what we do, um, bottom line, Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. We believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those living with the disease continue to live with purpose. Together, we're going to be able to help everyone just have a better understanding because so many of our friends, family, and colleagues and, and people in our own spheres are dealing with this, but they really haven't come out of the closet because they... Uh, there's so much fear and isolation wrapped in this disease. So at our core, we believe that collaboration is the only way we're going to win this battle against dementia. And I know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares. You see, each one of you has had such a significant impact on raising Alzheimer's Speaks profile just by sharing our information. Um, <clears throat> we were lucky enough to be um, awarded the number one influencer online, according to ShareCare and Dr. Oz. And that happened because you guys, you know, tweeted to your tribe and pushed out to your Facebook friends and your LinkedIn colleagues and your Pinterest peeps. Um, it really, truly is making a difference. And the more information we can have out there in the community the more likely people will tap into it when they're ready. So I really urge you to continue to do that. Everything we do, um, you know, we want it to be free and accessible for people to grab. And, uh, you know, I just feel so honored to be able to um, be able to help raise the voice of so many people who are dealing with dementia in, in so many different fashions. Um, today, we are going to be talking with Ben, ben Utek, who is a Super Bowl um, champion. He played for the Indianapolis Colts and the Cincinnati Bengals, and he is a national leader and motivational speaker, along with being an author. His new book is called Counting the Days While My Mind Slips Away, and it chronicles his miraculous journey into the NFL, his triumphs and struggles both on and off the field, and the hope he's discovered in the face of adversity. He now travels nationally sharing his, his story and hoping to inspire others to make the most of every single moment before them. And I know that you are going to be um, just so excited to hear his voice and his rich, authentic, authentic voice um, from which he speaks. This is a man who um, won the Ambassador's Award by the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance and in 2014 um, got the Public Leadership um, Award from the Neurological, um, that's the American Academy of, of Neurology. Which is um, it, which is just incredible. So welcome, Ben. So happy to have you with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Well, I'm I'm excited to hear more about your story. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your diagnosis? Well, it's been an incredible journey. Um, I grew up in a small river town in Minnesota called Hastings, where the Mississippi. And the St. Croix River, which comes down out of the uh, Lake Superior, meets. And uh, never would have imagined in a million years that I would have ended up uh, playing in the biggest game in the world uh, on, the, on the night of Super Bowl 41. I think over 100, 100 million people tuned in to watch that game. And, and uh, it just was so special uh, in so many ways. And um, 
created so many memories. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't until my career ended because of multiple concussions and uh, some of the uh, memory problems that I began to experience as a result of, of those concussions and, and having the diagnoses of amnesia. And so <clears throat> memories for the first time um, in my life, and it's, it's kind of sad for me to admit, but for the first time, um, had value. It, it, you know, we, we just we take them for granted so easily when when we're healthy. But uh, when you experience memory loss on a significant level, you begin to realize that uh, memories are really the mir- the miracles that make you relevant. It's it's it, it what gives gives you meaning and purpose and. Uh, it wasn't until I, I began to lose those because of concussions um, that I, I think for the first time in my life, realized how incredibly important my mind is to the makeup of who I am. I, I think that's such an uh, incredibly important statement because there is so much in life we take for granted. And and memories, like you said, are so critical. I mean, they they boost us forward. They tie us to the past. Um, they project us into the future. They allow us to see the joy in the moment. And when we're living such a fast paced life, I know, you know, my mom had dementia for 30 years. Um, Mm. her disease, I always say is my greatest gift because she just Mm. taught me to look at life so differently and the life lessons that she taught me through her disease, um, I, I, there's no way I could say thank you enough mm-hmm. because yeah. um, you just live life differently. And and I haven't been diagnosed, but the impact she had on me was huge. So mm-hmm. for to hear you say that, and I've heard so many others say that too, that we just we just take so much for granted in life. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to agree with you, and and I think what's been so incredible is I've traveled the country, um, you know, educating people um, specifically on concussions, but also trying to emotionally connect uh, people to their, to their minds and their memories, maybe for the first time. And, you know, it's really kind of how I've been able to do that is uh, to realize um, that we've all been concussed by life in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, for one in six in America, uh, it happens through brain disorder and brain disease. Uh, over 53 million people in this country and the caregivers that have to, like yourself, that have to uh, stand alongside of their loved ones. Um, and, and so we all get knocked off our feet. We all at times in our lives uh, feel like we're in, an ob- in a state of oblivion where we're just kind of spiraling out of control. But I, you know, I, I think what I learned through that is is uh, that we can all decide how we're going to get up. Mm-hmm. You know, we, 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 can, all, we can all decide um, the attitude that we're going to have. And I'm just really happy to hear you say that because I think it's um, – I, I stand along with you in saying that uh, all the injuries that I faced, which were many, uh, and then ending my career with concussions um, – I, I can look back and, and, and see how all of those injuries, because of the way I reacted to them, made me a better man, mm-hmm. uh, made, me, made me realize how much more valuable my life is in so many unique ways. And, and so I think we can all look within ourselves uh, and find that hope, uh, that we can take a bad situation, we can take suffering and trials, and we can turn them into something that can actually Uh, bring more value to our lives and make us better. And that's exciting. That's really, I I think it's very exciting, especially in this fast paced world. And um, to be able to slow down and really appreciate um, somebody um, and, and to really empower people. And, And I know you do that when you go out and speak, you know, you just inspire and empower people. And, and I hope to do that as well when I, when I'm out there speaking and, you know, I talk about, the, you know, do you want fears, tears, or joy? And everyone, you know, picks joy. Well, we have to focus on joy. You know, we have to stop. Mm-hmm. We have to stop looking at our past and oh, woe was me, and appreciate that. Gosh, I had what a mm-hmm. lot of people never ever had, 
And bottom line, yep. all of us are changing in all of life, not just people that, you know, end up with a chronic illness or a disease or some kind of setback. I mean, we're all, everyone's dealing with stuff, with change constantly. Mm -hmm. And those fears are what's in the future. And we can worry and worry and worry and go down the rabbit hole there. But then we're missing what's before us. And, and, mm -hmm. and what's before us is the only opportunity to, to find the joy and to create mm -hmm. it. And, yep. and there's so many precious things in life. So many. Uh, that, and, and, yeah, I like to... Oh, yep. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, 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 I kind of like to look at it as though we are... Uh, we are living memories mm -hmm. is kind of how I communicate it. We're, we're living memories because when you really think about the present, the present moment, uh, it, it, it's so small because it, it immediately goes into the short term and then the short term turns into the long term. And, it, and then it really depends on whether or not we're going to remember it. Um, you know, the moment is always going into the past and it is always going into the memory banks of our mind. And so I just, it, it just hit me so hard as I had to walk away from the game that I love and the game that I started playing when I was in fourth grade. Um, but it hit me so hard because I never really looked at myself as, as a living memory that, that uh, you know, what makes me relevant as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, only lives within the things that I can remember. Mm -hmm. and the things that people can remember about me. And so um, it's just been, it's been wonderful to, um, to meet all of the people um, who are battling through, um, you know, battling through their own uh, the disorders and, and diseases and the caregivers and, and uh, how many people are out there that just need, they, 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 they crave hope. They crave that, that, uh, you know, that purpose to keep moving forward. So I thank you for your, your show and everything that you're doing. Well, and I liked what you just said about, you know, the creating the moments in that it's a two way street. It's what you remember, but it's what people remember about you as well. Right. And I think it's so critical. I think one of the gifts about dementia is it forces us to make a choice of, you know, people talk about being person-centered all the time, but, you know, person-centered is, in my opinion, um, really about getting back to the core of our relationships and why we're with somebody to begin with. If it's a loved one, if it's someone, you know, we are working for, why are we there? You know, um, you know, hopefully it's to love and support them. And it's not about giving it all away. It's about letting a relationship flow naturally um, so mm -hmm. that it's a two-way street. So you are both creating moments and um, both remembering different things and, um, and, and just being in that place of peace. You know, um, I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen this, but so often I see people where they, they're so scared of silence. And silence mm -hmm. is a really beautiful thing, just sitting next to somebody that you love or that you're comfortable with and not having to say it, not, not having to use words. And right. looking at our all of our communication and that most of it really is nonverbal um, to begin with and learning to tap into that to be a better person. Um, to be mm -hmm. less judgmental. So I, um, like I said, I'm just so excited to have you with us because I think your story is just fascinating. I do want to ask you, in terms of your book, um, why did you pick the title you did? I always find that just really curious, how you came up with your sure. title. Well, I, uh, I'm a musician alongside of, of having played a, a sport and being a speaker. And uh, it's always been a unique way for me to express myself, and I love writing. Uh, and I was working on a project, and, and um, I was challenged by a friend um, to to write the letter to my wife and daughters. I have four beautiful daughters. And to write the letter to them uh, from the perspective of the, the, the former NFL player who um, – because of his concussion history may, may not remember them someday. Mm -hmm. And it was so 
hard to write. I, I, I remember just thinking to myself, why would I write that? You know, I don't want to go, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to spend any time in that, in that atmosphere of fear, mm -hmm. but it was such a therapeutic process. And so I wrote a letter and the letter turned into a song called you will always be my girls. That song turned into a music video, uh, which has since gone viral after I testified in Congress about the long-term effects of concussions. And the first line of the song is, I'm in here counting the days while my mind is slipping away. And so we decided to take something that was really special uh, from, from my life that uh, came from a letter that I wrote to my wife and daughters and, and really make that the, the statement of, of the book. Um, and so it, it, uh, it, it has an ominous, um, aspect to it, but really from my perspective as a husband and a father, it, it, it just, it's, it's authentic. It's just really comes from, I think what some of my greatest fears, uh, for the future are. Well, and I think to conquer those fears, I mean, to me, that's just so heroic and it just, uh, shows your character and the love that you have because doing something like that, it, it's not easy, but the gift and the legacy that you're leaving, not only your family, but to the world is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. That, that, that window. And, and like you said, you want to give hope and, you know, life's not always pretty And it. And it wasn't before you got diagnosed. I'm sure he had some ups and downs like the rest of the world, but we always seem to forget that life wasn't perfect before, you know, we have this situation, whatever, whatever it might be um, before our listeners, you know, it, it's just not perfect, you know, and yet we strive to be perfect. And I think that that's one of the the sad lessons is to let go of perfection and allow people, like you said, to be their authentic self. Because mm -hmm. um, when you get in that zone of truly being honest, I don't know for you, but for me, I just find just this calmness that comes to me. Mm -hmm. and, yep, and I you, can completely agree. Yeah, and, and when you have that calmness, you know, it's infectious, you know, and it, it ripples out to other people. My my friends, you know, joke that I'm the calm one, you know. <laughs> and and to me <laughs> and to me that's a huge compliment, you know. It might not be to somebody else, but um to me I think that's a good thing. That's I think we need more calmness in the world. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. can, can you tell us um in terms of the book itself, why you structured it the way you did and, and what people can find in your book? Sure. Well, you know, we were blessed to have a fantastic publisher in Simon and Schuster, um, and alongside their faith division, which is Howard Books, and they set forth a challenge, and that was to tell a, a true, vulnerable story that that definitely uh, ties into the concussion culture that has uh, uh, arisen um, over the last handful of years in sports, but they also wanted me to, they also, uh, and, and I think more importantly, wanted the book to be a lifestyle story. They wanted me to, to really share my journey, um, from being a, you know, a small town, a pastor's kid grew up playing catch with my dad in the backyard, uh, to, um, you know, to being on a Super Bowl championship field. And so, that story encompasses so many uh, different um, different elements to life uh, through faith, through family, uh, through football. Many uh, wonderful story between a between a father and a son throughout the book uh, and the lessons that I learned from my dad. Everything from uh, how to be competitive, how to be um, how to be how to treat a woman. Um, the lessons I learned from my for my dad as I was pursuing my wife, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to having to, to go through many injuries. It, it, it wasn't just the five documented concussions. It was, it was years. It was six broken ribs and broken back and torn shoulder and broken foot and broken hands. And I, I mean, the list goes on. It was just a, it was a, the, the, the game had a, had a, 
uh, a strong effect on on my physical body and and just the story of persevering you know because you love something so much you want to keep going and keep going until finally an injury came along that I that I couldn't overcome mm-hmm. and it was one that that uh, affected my my mind so it, it, you know that that was a long-winded way of saying it's a lifestyle story about um, discovering what really matters in life and and uh, when you do that uh, and you find true value uh, how it how it changes your purpose and it actually gives you more purpose and I, I really think if anything has come out of this book it's it's been that people have really enjoyed the journey that it's it's so much more than just football it's not a football book it's a life it's a lifestyle book mm-hmm well, and I, I think it's so, this whole thing about concussions is just so important. Um, we had Mike uh, Durosen on, you know, talking about his brother Dave and, um, you know, the work he's doing in schools. And, you know, it, it really seems like it's starting to get some attention um, that it deserves. And, you know, this is serious stuff. I mean, this is life-changing um things that that we can improve on and i don't think mm-hmm. sports is ever going to go away um but in terms mm-hmm. of of how we play them and right. um how we look at the seriousness of of these injuries i i think yeah. has forever changed um do you do you see that movement do you feel positive that things are are really yeah. happening or am i living in a bubble no, no, you're not living in the bubble. And I think that, I think, you know, sometimes I think uh, within the within the world of neurology, you can um, find frustration. I guess maybe maybe the word, um, because um, you know, sports has kind of taken a platform around what would seem to be a, an injury that's not as significant as uh, other diagnosed brain diseases, but. You know, my my challenge to people has always been uh, to just look at <clears throat> look at concussions as um, as a as a beacon that has actually brought to the surface um, the struggles that people are having with brain disease. I, I think, if anything, that concussions and the brain disease CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, have brought. Um, uh, into the public uh, arena is is how uh, how many people are suffering from brain disease and 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 so even though it's come through the lens of um, contact sports we're seeing a culture now beginning to put the brain uh, at a higher priority than it ever has before and I think that's going to affect neurology uh, as a whole and because CTE uh, is associated with similar proteins that uh, are found in Alzheimer's and in frontal lobe dementia. And I think we, you know, we are going to be able to really work together um, to find cures because I, I work with so many neurologists and it's, it's so fascinating to hear them talk about how many mechanisms are so similar uh, between brain diseases and brain disorder. And they really believe that if you can find the cure for one, uh, you will find the cure for many. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is really exciting. So we are all in this together. And um, if we can get more people to care, I think then more money will be donated and more research can be had. And uh, I, I always pray that that will lead to um, discovering maybe for the first time how to, how to, how to destroy some of these diseases. Mm -hmm. I agree. What is your thought um, between funds going to for research and funds going for support for people who are dealing with it right now? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important to, um, especially at a foundational level. I mean, obviously you're going to have very specific foundations created only for research and, and others created more for um, care, caretakers and, and really helping people going through it now. I think they're equally as important. Um, and when we look at some really successful foundations, whether it's the American Heart Association or, or Breast Cancer Awareness, 
um, they do such a good job of telling stories. Mm-hmm. And I think for so long, people just don't want to talk about brain disease because, you know, they, they, <clears throat> it's, it's hard for them to, to really uh, find hope. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I just think where we need to head, you know, moving forward is to really get the stories out there, to really have uh, people, um, to, you know, coming forward with, with courage to be able to, to share the experiences they're going through because, man, um, I think I've had more people that have seen my music video and heard the story that just said, you know, wow, I didn't realize that it, that it was affecting people like this or that it, that this was such a big deal. So I think that storytelling is going to be a, an integral role in, in achieving that goal. I, I agree. And, you know, when I started um, Alzheimer's Speaks, basically, I started it because I was frustrated that there weren't enough resources. And so one of our goals is to use multiple platforms like the radio show. And then I have something called Dementia Chats, which is really incredible because my panelists, my experts all have some form of dementia. And we talk, mm. we talk about daily issues like this morning we recorded one and we talked about voting. And mm-hmm. how do you support somebody f- for voting? Because there's a belief that people that have this diagnosis aren't capable. And many of them are capable, mm-hmm. but they need assistance, just like someone with that's blind, right. you know, right. with Braille and stuff. And so they came up with some fabulous solutions and ideas. And it was it's it's always so interesting. Or the one before that, we talked about doctors and diagnosis and support and or lack mm-hmm. of that they get when they when people go in. And how do we change that? How do we support people to again give hope and not just have this be a death sentence? Um, mm-hmm. Because people are living longer, and um, there's a lot of good life to be lived, even with a diagnosis of dementia. Um, but yet, so few people know that. So few doctors even know that. And mm-hmm. um, you know, we really we have to change that whole that whole impact. And I think, like you said, the best way to do that is through actual, authentic stories of people mm-hmm. living. Um, with the disease. Yes. Um, you know, I love that yep. you're getting out there speaking and um, influencing, um, you know, just being one of those um, change um, change elements out there. Um, we, mm-hmm. we need more and more of that. So, you know, I thank you for all you're doing. And you're using yeah. multimedia by getting out speaking, by your music, which is incredible. In fact, I think I know your cousin, Kim. Um and um, you know now your book and uh, and things. Do you talk at all with the NFL? Have you been in conversations with them about you know trying to influence how they could impact change at all, or is is that something I, you I, haven't pursued? I have, yeah, I have. Um, not 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 one on one with the actual uh, with with the NFL, but I do work alongside the NFL Players Association. Uh, and they, uh, in their creation of the uh, Mackie White Traumatic Brain Injury Committee, and so we get together a couple times a year and really uh, discuss, you know, how we can better serve and um, protect and support uh, players um, who have had concussions and obviously current players who are going to be facing, um, you know, uh, a in- potential injury like that, and so. They and then obviously the the NFLPA they are always working along with the NFL. So uh, I guess you know through the Players Association I'm I'm definitely doing what I can at that level to um, continue to make the game safer for for the uh, for the talented individuals that are playing. Okay, well that's that's great to hear. If they ever want some some insider um, ideas too, I would be more than open. Um, you know, the memory cafes are just such a wonderful support mm-hmm. system, and there's just uh, so many little things I think that they could offer that uh, many just don't know are out there. And um, right. just because of the voices I've talked to um, around the world, <clears throat> or the the influence in terms of uh, dementia-friendly communities. I mean, I just think, Mm -hmm, you know, the mm -hmm. NFL a lot of times wears pink for breast cancer. It would be lovely if they'd wear purple for dementia. And Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. acknowledge that, what they could do, um, just 
just to help change some of the stigmas and those, mm-hmm. you know, those big screens just to be able to have a voice heard so people could see something is different and, um, mm-hmm. and being proactive, you know, they can't, they can't control all of this. I, I get all of that. Um, but there's a lot that can be done um, that doesn't mm-hmm. have to cost a lot of time or money. And, you know, they're a PR machine. Um, and so they could, they could really, I think, help significantly with that. Um, let's get back to your, your story, though, because it is uh, just uh, an incredible one. What, what story of hope do you want people to walk away after they read your book, Counting the Days While My Mind Slips Away? Well, I think that the, the message that I've wanted people to uh, walk away with is um, – and, and, and the program that I, I that I use a lot, especially when I speak uh, in that concussion world, is I, I like to call using a sports uh, a sports theme uh, my M- MVP program, Mind, Value, and Purpose. And oh, and for that. me it was for me it was a journey of discovering how important my mind and memories are to my identity. And when that happened, uh, it it really made uh, me value every moment more clearly in my life. And when I began to live, uh, you know, carpe diem, when I began to seize the day and seize the moment and, and find value in the, in the little things like the five minutes every night of putting my daughters to bed and having a chance to sit next to them in their beds and ask them questions, you know, that before I I used to just kind of flippantly toss aside, um, you know, it, it has really forever changed my life and, and, and has given me more purpose. So I, I think we can all relate to that. I think, I think uh, everybody that reads this book, again, everybody goes through trials and suffering of their own kind. And so um, I, I think when we're faced with those, those times, those challenges, um, uh, we can make the choice to allow it to help us find value in every moment to seize the day and to, uh, you know, to step into a new purpose. And, and that actually is going to have an incredible impact on our day-to-day living. And that, that, is, uh, that was the powerful lesson that I myself learned, and I want hope that others will take away. Yeah, and that is a huge, huge lesson. I just think of, you know, what you're leaving your daughters to, to look at how you're choosing to live at life. Because so many times people don't think that we have a choice. And we always, we always have a choice to live mm-hmm. a, a bright and brilliant life. And, and I think the other thing that, you know, to me, it seems like uh, in society, people have forgotten about the value of purpose and what that does to your mindset. Because so many people are mm-hmm. just chasing a paycheck and trying to stay on top of their debt or keep up with the Joneses. And when you truly focus on your purpose, all that other stuff becomes not so important and mm-hmm. and you're really thriving on making the world a better place, not just your world, but things in general because of that that ripple effect that it has. And you know that's just such powerful stuff. Um, and and it can be taught it, but more so, I think uh, people soak it up just seeing others leading by example. You know, you could you could. Um, you know, lecture till you're blue in the face. But when people, somebody, see somebody actually walking the walk and um, and seeing that, boy, their their life seems more peaceful. They seem more comfortable. They seem happier. You know, all of those little things in the midst of what others would say is a tragedy. And not that we don't all have our moments, you know, where you just want to bang a wall and scream at the top of your lungs. Um, but for the most part, I think there's just that that gift of of calmness and being purposeful and being fulfilled. And I think that that's something very, very overlooked in in mm-hmm. life. And so I, I love your M, MVP, the mind, the value and the purpose. I, I think that that's just a that's a really cool way to to look at things. Um, well, and it's and it's great because and, and for. For anyone listening that's not a, a huge sports fan, I mean that 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 uh, signifies most valuable player. Every year they give the MVP award to the most valuable player in the NFL, the player who has given 
um, you know, given their team the greatest chance for success because of the way they've approached the game, the attitude that they've had. And so I just think that it, it's a nice, I think it's a nice metaphor for how we can all be MVPs in, mm-hmm. in, in life. We can all choose to, uh, to, um, to take that honor upon ourselves. And that's, that's a, that's a, uh, whenever you can give people the practical and tactical how to's, you know, that's achievable. And that's something that uh, I think gives people hope. Yeah. Well, and I like your practical and tactical, because if, if people can't walk away and implement it, if it's too complicated or it's not spoken in their language, we've lost them. You know, we've done a disjustice in so many times. You know, I'll go to conferences and people are talking way over people's heads or interest levels. You know, when when you can talk about how to really live graciously with this disease, mm-hmm. um, you know, you've just hit a home run. And, yeah. and people are, they're craving that because again, it, it all gets back to that hope because we, you know, here in the U S especially, I mean, we've been driven by fear. That's how we've always raised money. That's how we, you know, get the job done. And, you know, it's not, it isn't what people are saying they need anymore. You know, they, mm-hmm. they really want, they want hope. And if you give them hope, they'll still give you money and they'll probably stick around a little longer too <laughs> versus saying yep, I'm yep. Done, done with this part of my life. Um, can you tell us, you know, what does your life and career look like, you know, after dementia or, or after football now? Um, you know, how, how have you seen it change? And I know you've mentioned a few things, but, um, you know, are there some other examples you can give us? Well, it's, I mean, just on this, uh, you know, uh, what comes to mind immediately is uh, the the life transition is very difficult. Um, I think a lot of people assume that if you make it to professional sports, then you're set financially for the rest of your life. And, and uh, you know, even when you're done playing, you just go into the real world and everything works out and, the, the, the reality is, is that it's very challenging. The average NFL football career is only two and a half to three years. Um, 70% of all retired football players are bankrupt within two years after they leave uh, the NFL. It, it, it's very challenging to, um, to have an identity uh, revolving around a sport that you've played since you were a child and then to have it be completely removed. And now you have to step into the real world, you know, usually uh, a decade behind everybody else and, and figure out your, your, uh, your new identity. Who are you now that, that sports doesn't work? So for me, it, it was uh, speaking in music. My degree was in speaking. I grew up as a pastor's son, so I got to watch my dad do it every week. And I have a huge passion uh, to use words and, and action to move people. And, and so speaking is, is, uh, is really where I'm pouring a lot of my time today. Um, music is always a fun, uh, is always a fun accent. Uh, I think to my life, it, it always surprises people to listen to the singing football player, <laughs> you know, but that's a lot of fun. Uh, and music can connect uh, with people in so many incredible ways and can even be used as, as, as treatment, uh, in, in some uh, brain situations. And then everyday life, I have to be honest with you, has, has, um, uh, there have been challenges, especially with some of my situational memory gaps from the past. But uh, over the last year, and I talk about this in the book, I, I partook in a 100 hour intensive cognitive training program that took my short and long-term memory from the 12th and 17th percent, according to my neuropsychological evaluation. And uh, when I finished the program, um, it took my short and long-term to the 78th and 90th percent. Wow. And I've had an incredible, um, I've had an incredible strengthening of my memory storage and recall over the last year. And it's been noticeable to my family and friends. And, and so uh, I'm in a really good place today. And it's given me a lot of hope for the future. Wow, that's great. Now, is it Memory RX? Is that what you utilized? 
It's a, it's a company called Learning RX. Oh, and Learning it RX. Estab- okay. Yeah, it was established twenty over twenty years ago to help children with learning disabilities, but but it has evolved since and um, really at its core, all that it is is um, is uh, cognitive uh, exercises that you sit across from a brain trainer with. Um, an hour and a half session at a time, and you work diligently to improve your cognitive weaknesses. And um, it has had a, a vast, you know, impact on on my on my memory. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that's fantastic to know. So learning RX. Um, might be something that that others want to check into. Um, oh, absolutely! Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and I have to tell you that I've always been pretty skeptical of of um, of supplements and some of the things that just get thrown out into into the world and claim to do this to the brain or that to the brain. But when I asked my neurologist friends at the American Academy of Neurology about cognitive um, training. Um, their reaction was, well, this is pretty, this is common sense in neurology that if you, if you train specific cognitive weaknesses over and over and over again, that they will improve. And I said, so really it's like when I worked out in football and I I worked out my body and my muscles got stronger and they said, essentially, yes. And, and so I, this is for everyone. And I think, I think that, um, you know, the idea of strengthening our plasticity in the brain, the idea of strengthening um, injured neural pathways and, and accessing new pathways that, that may have never been accessed uh, before uh, is, is only going to benefit. Um, and that's exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. And, you know, it it's so sad that most of us, you know, don't take it seriously enough to to utilize it um, be, even before we need it, um, mm-hmm. and and because um, there's a lot of great things out there, and you know it's and and I'm I'm there too. You know, it's like squeezing it into a day, um, but it's just it's so important for people to know these things are available, and um, and to really look look at what do you want your life to mm-hmm. be like? Um, and it's very exciting, you know, uh, the studies that are being done right now about rebuilding those pathways and, and how does that occur and what does that look like? And so very, very cool. Um, I have a, a, a question because I'm sure a lot of our audience is wondering, but what is what would be your message to parents of children who are currently playing contact sports? Well, I think number one, and I can only speak as a as a parent myself and as an advocate, but number one, I just really encourage parents to be educated. Uh, and I know that that can, can sound like a, a, a one-liner, but the truth is, is that so many parents just don't know what to do whenever they're in a situation um, of of having a concussed child. And so if you're going to allow your children to play contact sports, I really think that you should take responsibility for educating yourself. Know what a concussion is. Know what to do if your child faces a concussion. Know where to go and know who to see. And I think I've, uh, you know, having been honored to be a spokesperson for uh, for many neurologists on the issue of concussions, I really encourage parents to build a relationship with a neurologist or a sports neurologist, someone who is an expert in in um, in the brain, so that if their child does in fact face a concussion, they can go see a brain expert that they have uh, started a relationship with, and and that's so important. If we can do that, I think we'll, we'll bring a lot of peace to parents' minds. And then secondly, I, I, I just think it's always good for us as a culture to uh, open conversation about the timing of entrance into contact sports. When, when should a child uh, put on a, a football helmet, as an example, and 
and and uh, enter into a full contact sport? Should it be in first and second grade like it is in America today? I, I don't know. I think that that's where we have to uh, begin and answer some some difficult questions. Yep. I agree. And and the other thing is, you know, concussions can happen not just from sports contacts, but car accidents, falls, you know, uh, all of those types of things can come into play too. I had a um, yeah. I had a girlfriend whose daughter was in um a really bad car accident, actually a couple of them. And, you know, was told she's just got to lay still, no texting, no TV, no nothing. You have to rest your brain. And, you know, you you wonder what is going to be the long-term effect of something like this. So, um, and again, I, I, knowing where to go is so important. But I think we have to, we have to push, you know, our medical professionals. You know, we have to re- request those second opinions if we're not feeling comfortable. And we have to get involved with our schools and, you know, our different sports teams and ask those ask those questions before something happens, so you know what to expect and and how they're looking at things. Um, very very important. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this has just been a, such a great conversation. I just I, I could talk with you all day long, and I I really want people to go. Now you've got a YouTube channel, correct? With your your song, songs and stuff. On I do. It? Okay. Do you want to? I do. I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, 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 um, well, on, you know, you can just, if you just go to YouTube and search for You Will Always Be My Girls, it will appear. It's also on my website, which is www.ben utech.com, U T E C H T. You'll also find, you know, my speaking programs on there as well. And, and anytime I have an opportunity to, or any chance I have an opportunity to, to share my story, I'll, I'll take it. Well, that's wonderful because people need to hear your your voice, Ben. You're just doing um, miraculous things. So um, keep up the great work. And um, like I said, I'm just so impressed with your attitude and your philosophy of moving Thank forward you. and really, really embracing life. And, um, you know, I just loved when you said, you know, use the example of just tucking your girls into bed. It's a whole different experience for you now. Um, Absolutely. Yes. And I think it's important for people to realize the, you know, with any um, tragedy, there is beauty and there are lessons to be learned. Um, But you're only going to find them if you ask to be shown and um, to to believe that they exist. And um, your, your, your life really can be richer and not that anybody would ask, you know, to, to have, um, CTE or any other form of dementia, you know, it's not about that, but if you're chosen to have that, if that's in your life's path, there's, there's a reason. And there, there is something still to be learned and something that can continue to give you value and purpose and, um, in beauty. So don't, absolutely don't ever give up that hope. Um, again, to um, reach um, Matt uh, or um, Ben, you can uh, go to his website, www.ben- and then his last name is U-T-E-C-H-T dot com. He's also on Facebook and Twitter, so make sure that you uh, check him out there. And you can also um, contact Matt at Matt at Ben. And then again, dash and then utech.com. And all that information is on our radio page and also on our blog and, and on our homepage on Alzheimer's Speak. So again, thank you so much. Any last words that you want to share with our audience? Well, I just want to encourage people to keep telling their stories. And uh, as, as difficult as, as they can be to talk about, the, the more uh, vulnerable you're willing to to be, the more transparent uh, you're willing to be, uh, the more people will uh, maybe understand for the first time how important their minds are to their identity. And that that is how you change culture. Exactly. Well, you continue to be our MVP, mind, value, and purpose there. And um, again, thank you so much for your time, Ben. Really appreciate it. 
You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you that are new to the Alive and Social Network, you might want to check in and uh, check out What's for Dinner Tonight with Rachel Perrin, who's a culinary director for Kowalski's Market, along with her producer and sidekick, Adam Lee. They are joined by foodtastic friends and colleagues to chat about seasonal flavors, favorite foods, trending topics in nutrition, and everything that's yummy for your tummy. Their podcasts only average about 10 to 15 minutes, so you can squeeze it in and get some great ideas for dinner. You can also go to www.kowalskis.com to find menu suggestions, and that's K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I-S.com. If you haven't uh, had a chance to check out some of our latest shows, uh, we just did one in Living in the Land of Dementia, which is a book by Deborah Schaus. We also talked about living in a dementia community care, and uh, we talked about dementia and coconut oil and what what is all the buzz. All of our shows are archived, so you can listen to them anytime. Uh, We did just post a brand new Dementia Chance webinar where our panelists all are living with dementia, and we had a fantastic discussion about what happens when someone is diagnosed. How do they get diagnosed What are some of the changes to the support system that needs to happen uh, to help people living with this diagnosis, both those individuals and their families? And you're going to hear some shocking yet similar stories and trends and a lot of ideas on how we can change our dementia care culture and improve the lives of so many. Um, We will be having a a session in Dementia Chats. I just have to get it edited out on dementia and pets and also the voting process and the impact on dementia. Both fascinating conversations. If you are interested in uh, seeing um, a screening of the the wonderful Hollywood film, His Neighbor Phil, I'm going to be at uh, Hopkins High School at 2 p.m. on October 30th. I'll be down in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, November 10th, and then at St. Therese in Woodbury, Minnesota here, November 16th. Um, And we would love to have you see that um, film. It really shows the ripple effect this disease has. I also want to point out um, an article that was written by um, Michael Ellenbogen. I, I'm sorry, it wasn't Michael Ellenbogen. It was uh, it was George Seiler um, who wrote a beautiful, beautiful poem actually called Ode to Annie. And uh, his wife had passed and it's just getting great accolades all over the world and uh, people are sharing that. So check that out. I look forward to talking to you soon. Our next show will be on Thursday. So check it out. Have a great week, everyone. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.